Thank you for tuning in to the Voice of the Victim podcast. We discuss a lot of sad and potentially triggering things on this show. We try to be as sensitive and cautious as possible, but if you are sensitive to things involving abuse and may be triggered, please think twice before listening to our show. Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast. My name is Ryan. And I'm Rosie. How are you doing tonight, Rosie? Well, I just got out of the shower, so I'm feeling good. Cool. Nice and clean. Yeah, we were going to go on a walk, but... It's, it's so windy. Yeah, you might be able to hear it, and we apologize if it's distracting or annoying. It's just so windy outside, and we don't have a soundproof studio, so... Um, before we get into the topic of the week, we're going to share a review. Mm -hmm. So Rosie, do you want to read it or should I? I'll read it. All right. It's titled really trying to do something different. Five stars. It says, I really like these two. They grew on me with time. I always thought the show had something special in the way they genuinely try to give people impacted by violent crime and abuse, the space and time they deserve. I'm sure it isn't easy to get so emotionally involved in the subject, but I appreciate it. I never write or I never review anything, but I felt this show deserved the extra time. They're working really hard in addition to producing this content, and I want them to succeed. Good job, you guys, and don't listen to the haters. They can go drool over Ted Bundy and about 30 other true crime podcasts. You're doing this genre in a more human centered, ethical way, in my view. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank that, you, Tracy. Tracy, 2018, from Great Britain. Oh, cool. I love international reviews. Not that I don't appreciate American ones, but that's really cool. Mm -hmm. I really uh, like that review. Yeah, and before we jump into the story, we also want to mention, um, if you go leave us a review on Podchaser within the next... I believe there's a couple days left. Um, it was 15 days starting on April 2nd. So I believe that um, fi until the 16th or so, Podchaser will be donating 25 cents per review that's posted on their site. So go review us. Go review your favorite podcast. They're going to be donat donating to Meals on Wheels um, and their, specifically their response fund for COVID-19 to help out people that were affected by that. So go leave reviews for your favorite podcast over there. Also, we'll be responding to any reviews that we get um, because they'll double the donation for any um, responses from podcasts. So let you guys know about that over on Podchaser. We have gotten a few reviews over there, and we will be reading them in future episodes. So thank you for um, the ones who have already gone and done that from our Instagram post. But we just wanted to make sure that everyone who listens is aware of it because it's a, it's a free way for us to help out in some way. Yeah, it gives you something to do Yeah, <laughs> for those who are stuck at home. Yeah, exactly. And again, like I've said, if you've been affected by COVID-19, please reach out to us and share your experiences because um, we know it's a difficult time for a lot of people. So without further ado, this week we're covering another listener request from uh, one of our wonderful listeners, Tyler, who we really appreciate. So tonight we are telling the story of Adam Coleman, also known as Zoe Pereira, and we'll explain later why there's two names. Um, but this is just from last year. Hmm. So fresh. Yeah. And listener beware from at the top. It's very disturbing and sad. I mean, we got a lot of good feedback on last week's episode. 
But this one is right up there with that, so brace yourselves. It's going to be a doozy. Good to know. All right, you ready to jump into it? Mm-hmm. On Sunday, May 5th, 2019, a man was driving down Baisley Boulevard in Queens, New York City at 8.52 p.m. This is when he saw a sports sedan driving erratically. The car jumped onto a sidewalk near 154th Street, and a man ran out of the car engulfed in flames. So, that's crazy. Mm, what a sight. Yeah. This is like a what-would-you-do situation. Although I don't think they'd do anything this extreme. But this man quickly pulled over to help. So, solid dude. The man grabbed a blanket out of his car and ran to the man on fire, using the blanket to put out the flames. And obviously that's not something you come across often. But after the flames were put out on this man, he started yelling. Right. He started saying that his baby was in the car. But there was no way the man who pulled over would be able to help her. The car was completely engulfed in flames, so instead he called 911. But when he did, the owner of the car ran off toward the nearby Baisley Pond. He was tearing off his clothes as he ran, and then he jumped into the water. Yeah, so this is a really intense situation. The car is on fire and there's a kid inside. Can you even imagine? Like, you're just driving and all of a sudden this happens to you? No. It would be... I would be in shock, I think. Like, are you serious? It's one of those things where it's so insane you can't believe it's happening. It's so surreal. I would imagine. But, I mean, this guy's trying to help, but the dad ran off and jumped into the pond. So, I mean, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Thankfully, the authorities arrived soon after. Right, and they found a charred-up luxury sports sedan. Which was a 2008 Audi A6. The first responders were determined to do everything they could to help the child inside. When they opened the door to the back seat, they realized the doors had been chained shut from the inside. Someone had fastened a chain to each of the back seat doors and then chained them together so they wouldn't open. The heat of the flames had caused the door handles to melt away, so they actually could open the doors. They also noticed a heavy stench of gasoline, and they realized the inside of the car had been drenched with it. So, it's pretty glaringly obvious that whoever put these chains on the door meant to harm this child, and was trying to use gasoline as an accelerant. What the heck? This is insane i know like what could possibly have led to this situation the child a little girl was strapped into her car seat in the back seat of the vehicle she was rushed to the jamaica hospital in queens but there was nothing they could do to save her i mean she never even had a chance so let that sink in like this is one of the most evil things i could imagine a person doing Mm mm-hmm to a child. What's confusing is, I mean, if the little girl was strapped in her car seat, what was the point of even chaining the, well, I suppose for outsiders to try to get into the car? I, why? And this is so confusing. Yeah. And from the be- very beginning, it's very obvious that it's premeditated. Right. I mean, absolutely evil. So the little girl... They found out that her name was Zoe Pereira. But like we mentioned in the beginning, we've actually named the episode Autumn Coleman. It turns out that her two parents couldn't agree on a name. But we're going to call her Autumn from now on, and you'll realize why as we go on. Autumn Coleman was barely three years old when she suffered that horrific death. Her mother was a 36-year-old medical assistant named Sharon Coleman and her father was a 39-year-old construction worker named Martin Pereira. And speaking of which, Martin had run from the fiery wreck of the car and down to that pond when we last talked about him. When authorities first arrived at the wreck, Martin was nowhere to be found. But they noticed a piece of clothing on the way down to the pond that was still smoldering, and they found Martin in his underwear hiding. So, this is suspicious, If he was trying to run, I mean, 
you'd have a really rough time flying under the radar in New York City wearing just your underwear. I mean, it's not like you could just run into the woods. You know, there's people everywhere. In At the New same York City. time, though, like he just suffered a super traumatic situation. So maybe he was just in shock and didn't know what to do. True. And I mean, some of his clothes were still smoldering, and that's how the police found him. So that explains why he ran down to the pond. Mm hmm. Martin was also in serious need of medical attention. He was brought to the burn center at Weill Cornell Medicine. Upon closer examination of the vehicle, they found a tube that led to the trunk of the vehicle, and in the trunk was a propane tank, wide open to fuel the blaze. There were also small plastic gas cans in the front and back seats of the car, partially burnt. So, can you imagine how terrifying and painful it must have been for her to be in there and completely helpless? I mean... Like I said, this is one of the most cruel things I've ever heard being done to a child. Mm -hmm. So who would do this? And what could someone possibly have against this poor little girl for them to plan this out and make this happen? Mm -hmm. Right. Like this obviously is something that they thought about for a while. Well... It turns out that Autumn's parents, Sharon and Martin, were in the middle of a pretty heated custody battle at the time that this all happened. Just a few months before this, in February of 2019, Sharon and Martin had been engaged. So we're going to do a short walkthrough of Sharon and Martin's relationship based on Facebook posts that we found that are actually still up. On May 28th, 2015, Sharon and Martin officially started dating. On February 7, 2016, Sharon's sister, Nicole, threw her a baby shower to celebrate Sharon's pregnancy with Autumn. At the party, Martin proposed to Sharon and they got engaged. Sadly, that same night, tragedy struck unexpectedly when Sharon's father had a heart attack. He ended up dying that night, which put wedding plans on hold and added a strain in their relationship, which was already far from perfect. So... Uh, this was a huge day for them. It started as just a baby shower, turned into a proposal, and then ended in the death of a family member. So who would have seen that coming? This really sucks for her family. And there's nothing official I could find on this, but based on some Facebook photo digging, I'm guessing Autumn's birthday is March 16th, 2016. Despite all the tough circumstances... Sharon was really happy to be pregnant again after suffering through a miscarriage the last time she was pregnant. The family lived in a one-bedroom apartment and Autumn slept in a crib next to their bed. Sharon would hold her daughter's hand as they fell asleep. Oh, that's really cute, actually. Yeah. Autumn was a beautiful baby girl and she wanted to be a princess doctor when she grew up. Sharon posted a video of her daughter dancing as a toddler. Yeah, she was really cute and just full of personality. But on March 13th of 2019, tension in Martin's, Martin and Sharon's relationship escalated when she returned the ring. It was a rough split, which began a bitter fight over custody of their daughter. They both wanted custody of Autumn, but a few days before the fire incident, a family court judge ruled that Martin would have custody for over the weekend of May 4th and 5th. On May 4th, just after getting his daughter, Martin brought Autumn to the Cohen Children's Medical Center in Queens to get her treatment. He told them that the girl's mother was a drug dealer and was addicted to her own products, and that she had been abusive to their daughter. That's a lot to say. Yeah. So it's not clear in any sources whether Autumn actually had any physical signs of abuse. But whether she did or not, the doctors sent her home with him after he showed them the custody papers. And I'm just thinking, if someone brings a child into the doctor with signs of abuse and is blaming it on someone else that isn't there, you'd at least report it and do a little investigating while you have the child in your care. But just because something would be ideal doesn't mean it's policy. I just personally feel that doctors need to be the biggest skeptics on the planet when they're treating a child with signs of abuse. And they should be prepared to ask those tough questions to make sure the safety of the child, 
you know, is happens. And I guess hindsight's twenty twenty, but I'm hoping that she didn't have any sense of abuse and he just, you know, wanted to get her checked out. But now let's talk about Martin. He's the only one throwing out these accusations to Sharon. But what does Sharon have to say about him? Uh, According to Sharon and her family, Martin had been acting erratically ever since their breakup in March. Two days after Sharon returned the ring, he showed up to pick up Autumn for a visit, and Sharon's mother, Denise, noticed that he was wearing the ring on his pinky and kept twisting it. It made Denise feel really uncomfortable. Yeah, she was getting weird vibes from him. The kind of vibes that make you question someone's sanity. Well, that is really weird. I mean, yeah, that, after, who does that? After they broke up, too, yeah. it's just like, you gotta start moving on. Denise called Sharon after this and told her that Martin was freaking her out when she saw him. Shortly after this, Martin started reporting Sharon to child protection agencies and suggesting that she was harming their child. Yeah, so this is long before he had her for the May 4th and 5th weekend. This um, is after they broke up in March. So we're going back in time here to before he even brought her into the hospital. After these allegations, a child welfare investigator arrived at Sharon's home to evaluate it. They checked that it was clean, stocked with food, and they made sure there were no drugs. They also took Autumn to the hospital for an evaluation to check for signs of abuse, and there was nothing. They even ordered Sharon to take a drug test, based on Martin's claims, and that came back clean. So Martin demanded a hair follicle test. It almost feels like (laughs) bullying at this point. Like, a drug test came back clean, so he wants a more specific drug test, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. But... I guess it's great to see them taking abuse allegations seriously. I was just going to say that, that this seems like the best job they've done in the cases that we've talked about. Well, yeah. At least they're checking the mother out well, you know, if that rings any bells from last week. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, they did a thorough job checking out her living situation. But when Sharon went to the same system with her concerns, she was ignored. She noticed that Martin had become increasingly unhinged in the weeks leading up to Autumn's death. On April 23rd, Sharon took the day off of work to try to convince the judicial referee in Queens to end the weekend visits with Martin. So, seeing all the effort that Sharon has to put in here just to get them to take a look at Martin, you see a double standard here again, Mm -hmm. like we saw last week. And I just want to mention, Sharon was a hard worker. She had worked at the same office for almost 20 years, so she must have been reliable. Sharon's lawyer was on vacation at that time, but she was becoming really worried for her daughter and didn't want to risk waiting, so she did it herself. Sharon wrote, I'm very afraid for my child's safety and mental development with her deranged father. Her father is losing a grip on reality, and I honestly feel my child is in danger while in his care. She waited on the judicial referee for hours that day, but the referee, Margaret Mulrooney, adjourned the issue until June. And as we know now, June was too late. I mean, this was the end of April that she was trying to take action, and we know that on May 5th, Autumn was no longer with us, so. Sharon was ordered to turn her daughter over to Martin on the weekends, and despite her concerns, she obeyed the judge's decision. Again, on Saturday, May 4th, Martin had been in the hospital accusing Sharon of abuse. But the next day, on the morning of May 5th, he started trying to call Sharon. And I'm guessing she just wanted to get this weekend over with so she could get her daughter back. Sharon refused to answer his calls because she was so sick of his erratic behavior. So he called up Sharon's cousin instead who answered. What he said in this call terrified the cousin. After the call, they realized they needed to do something to intervene. In the phone call, Martin had apparently threatened to kill himself and Autumn. 
So can you imagine the panic you'd feel if an unstable man said this while he had your daughter in his possession? That would be absolutely terrifying. Oh, I can't even imagine. Like, how helpless. The cousin told Sharon to get her brothers and call the cops. They had to do something. Sharon finally called Martin back to try to talk to him and talk him down, but he started yelling, quote, Do I have your attention now, bitch? I got your attention now. You're never going to see your daughter again. After this call, Sharon frantically called 911 to report it and her fear of what he would do. Police arrived at her house soon after, and she called him again on FaceTime. She wanted to talk him down and show the officers why she was concerned and help them figure out where he was. But Martin spotted one of the officers in the background of the call and got really mad. He yelled in a rage, I know you're talking to the cops. And she replied, yeah, I am. You're effing crazy. Where's my daughter? He wouldn't reveal where they were and replied, yeah, I'll make you crazy. You're never going to see your daughter again. And then he just hung up on her. She called him back, but he just kept yelling incoherently. I can't even imagine the torment and unsettling terror Sharon must have been feeling here. Just She's been fighting so hard to keep custody of her daughter for months and trying to protect her just to have the legal system order her away from her. You know, they ordered her to give him, give her over to her father for this weekend and then be in the situation where this maniac has control of your daughter Mm -hmm. and you don't know, you don't know where she is. And I can't believe the cop was spotted in the FaceTime video. I know. Come on. Like, aren't you a professional? But, but, I mean, I guess they're probably just trying to see where he is. But still, like, can't law enforcement just track your phone these days if they really need to find you? Like, instead of trying to get your location through a crappy FaceTime video? You know? I thought that that had to do with the phone companies and, like, their contract with you. Uh, well, you'd think there could be exceptions made to personal privacy rights in situations like this, you know? If mm-hmm. they know he's doing this, that should waive his rights to privacy, you'd think. You would think. But I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I'm sure that they would have to go to a judge and get a warrant based on this video to, and then go to the phone company, and it's just this whole legal fiasco that would take them hours when they don't have that kind of time. Mm -hmm. After this call, Sharon went with the police to the 113th precinct of the NYPD. She was sitting right there when she heard a call over the police radio at 8.52 p.m. about a car on fire. This is so tragic. She went with them to the scene and watched as they pulled her daughter out of the flaming wreck. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so what can we even say about that? But there's a quote from when she talked to the New York Post that just breaks my heart. Rosie, will you read that? She told them, After I saw my daughter, I knew there was no way she survived that. I knew she was dead from the moment they took her out of the car. So just try to imagine the pain she experienced here. Like after her daughter was literally forcefully taken away from her when she's trying to protect her, and then this is what happens. Oh, I can't... That is something I could never even think of. How how would you feel? Like Yeah, she her daughter was literally stolen from her, and you can't get that back. You can't get her back now. This is just... Yeah, that children lose... The, or parents lose their children... And death, but that way, yeah, and that so kind of torture. Unnecessarily, and to know how terrible her last few moments were. That is something, that's something I hope no one ever experiences. Oh, it feels so bad for Sharon and her family. Well, Sharon was understandably hit with a flurry of emotions. She began to think that she should have just kept her and gone to jail despite the court order. She always thought he might show up and try to hurt her, but he never expected him to hurt their daughter. Yeah, and her, I mean, 
what she must have been experiencing is unfathomable to me, mm-hmm. but it partially shines through in what she told the New York Daily News. She said, He's the effing devil. I wish I could torture him and kill him. I can't imagine the pain my baby went through. She was burned terribly. Her bones were out, and he ran off and left her to burn to death. Why would he do this to my daughter to get to me? It doesn't make sense. I feel so bad for her. And, like, ugh. It gives me goosebumps. It's just... Yeah. I mean... You can't blame her for wanting to torture him, you know? It's just what I can't even imagine. And it's a really good question. Why? Why would he do this? It seems to me like he wasn't taking the breakup well, and he just wouldn't let Sharon go. And she was ignoring him because he needed to move on, and he resorted to this to try to get her to pay attention to him. It's a a 39-year-old man acting like a petulant child. Obviously, there's something seriously wrong with him if this is how he thought he'd get positive attention. Yeah, you would hope that he has something wrong with him to be able to do something like this. Sharon's mother, Denise Coleman, talked to the New York Post nine months after this all went down. She said that Sharon had been in agony since this all happened. But thankfully, she was trying to move forward and had recently gone back to work, hoping that getting back into a routine would help her cope with the devastation. And that was just this year. This was like this past February, I think. So she's still going through this right now. Denise told them, He was so selfish. He wanted to hurt my daughter, so he murdered my grandbaby. He burned her alive. She also said that Martin's family never reached out to Sharon after Autumn's murder. I mean, I get that you wouldn't know what to say, and they also lost their granddaughter or niece or whoever she was to them, but it would be a really hard thing to talk about, and possibly they would worry that Sharon's family wouldn't even want to hear from them. But it would have probably meant a lot and been something to bond over, and I guess... This is just a good example for the rest of us that it never hurts to reach out and give someone support when they're going through a rough time. Yeah, I don't think there's any excuse for not reaching out. It was their granddaughter. Right. So I'm a little confused why they wouldn't do anything. I mean, at least write a card or send a text or do something. Right. But I'm not going to pass judgment on them because, I mean, they were probably just as blindsided by Martin's actions, and they're not responsible for his actions. Mm -hmm. But just, if you're going through a rough time and you know other people that are also affected by the same thing that hurt you, nothing is more healing than being there to support someone else, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just something to think about. Well, needless to say, Martin Pereira was held in police custody and continued to get treatment for his burns. 70% of his body was burned. Good. He was charged with reckless endangerment, arson, and murder in connection with Autumn's death. But because of his medical condition, he never had to answer to his charges. A former co-worker of Martin's corroborated Sharon's statements about his behavior. Angel Rivera said that Martin had been increasingly agitated since the breakup, and the custody battle just exacerbated it. He had expressed a feeling that the courts were citing against him, and he was worried that his daughter was being exposed to marijuana smoke. Seriously, dude? You left her in an inferno? Like, who are you to complain about some cannabis? And obviously kids shouldn't be exposed to that, but it sounds like this was just something he was making up or blowing out of proportion to get the mom in trouble. Rivera told the New York Times, quote, There was a lot of stress building up in him. It made him explode up like that. And this is way more than just an explosion of passion because of stress or something like that. Is she defending him? I don't. It feels like it. But this was planned out. He had tubing from a propane tank to the cabin of his car. And he had gasoline and chains to hold the door shut. He even tried to frame Sharon for child abuse. So exploding in anger is a lot different than what Martin did here. Mm -hmm. This was 
first degree murder and if there could be something even worse than first degree murder it would be whatever that is and another thing that really disgusts me is that he posted a picture of autumn just hours before he killed her and we're going to post this picture to our instagram but she's sitting on a countertop with balloons behind her and his friends were commenting about how big she's getting and how cute she is like while this is all happening how could he post this oh, with man. what he was about to do to her? This guy is messed up. It's so insane. And it's just so sad to look at this little girl and know what was going to happen to her in just a couple hours. Yeah, this guy is like the stuff of nightmares. The pure evil. I know. And it turns out that there was a file at the Child Services Administration with a record of past complaints concerning Autumn. The files are not public, but it sounds like Sharon and Martin had each filed reports against each other for child abuse. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say, based on these actions and what Martin did, I'm not going to take any reports that he filed seriously and say that Sharon's were much more valid. I don't know if that's biased or whatever, but I think it's fair after what he did. And it turns out this wasn't even his first arrest. That's right. Six years before he killed his daughter, Martin was arrested and charged with aggravated assault and harassment of his 21-year-old ex-girlfriend. But Sharon had no idea about this until after the murder, because the records had been sealed. Yeah, and this probably would have been good for her to know about before having a kid and a relationship with this man. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how this could have been sealed and just swept under the rug like it never happened, because you'd hope that... After you assault someone, that would follow you around, you know? Well, and you'd hope that if you want to be in a relationship with someone, that you're going to know these kind of things. Yeah. To decide if you really want to be with them or not. Yeah, but when assault charges are sealed and kept private, this is the kind of thing that happens. Needless to say, Sharon was devastated by this. But she still keeps Autumn's memory alive. On March 16th, 2020, just a few weeks ago, she decorated Autumn's grave for her birthday and posted a picture of it to Facebook. Sharon left Autumn's rain boots by the door of their home, as well as her bunny slippers. Her personalized monogram toy box still sits where it was. Her crib is turned into a shrine full of stuffed animals, a blanket with photos of Sharon and Autumn, a jersey from a local sports team with a number three, and other tributes from family and friends. But Sharon had a real emotional struggle, trying to talk about her daughter without becoming enraged with how this all played out. How she tried to warn the family courts, but no one would listen. And when Sharon was being interviewed, she would sometimes get overwhelmed with the reality of all of it and need to leave the room. And then she'd come back wiping away tears with Autumn's burp cloth which had a mother bear and cub on it with pink bows. I mean, these moments show how this type of thing affect people so powerfully, you know. Mm. And you may wonder why we've been calling her Autumn Coleman when she's more commonly known as Zoe Pereira. Well, one of the areas of tension in the relationship between Martin and Sharon was that they couldn't agree on a name for the child. Sharon wanted to name her Autumn, but Martin wanted to name her Zoe. Unfortunately, Zoe Pereira was the name that was used by the media and the name that got popular, but I'm going to say that Sharon has every right to name her daughter because of what Martin did. Mm -hmm. She wasn't married to Martin, and he acted like a complete freak during this whole process and ended up killing his daughter. So he has no right to name her. Yeah, why would the media do that? Why wouldn't they respect the mother's wishes? Well, I don't think they had all the facts when they broke the story. But mm. On January 28th, 2020, Martin Pereira was taken off life support. He died at 6.20 p.m. He never recovered from the burns he sustained while murdering his daughter. Sharon's family was shamelessly happy to hear about this. Autumn's grandma, Denise, said... I hope he burns in a sub-basement of hell. I'm happy he's dead. If I could dance a jig, I would. 
I mean, you can't, can't say blame I'm, them. Yeah, I'm not shedding a tear. I don't believe in karma, but if I did, this would be the perfect example of it. He laid in a hospital bed, suffering from his burns for seven months. I mean, nothing could pay the price for what he did to Autumn, and I'm not saying people should be tortured, but he did this to himself, and I think it gives the family a little comfort knowing that he did suffer for a while and that he's no longer around to hurt anyone else. Yeah, I think so too. But the question still remains, why? What on earth would possess someone to do this to an innocent little girl? Was it really just because he was upset about the breakup? It couldn't have been about custody because what he did defeats the whole purpose of that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's obvious to me that he had this very meticulously planned out. Up until the part where he was on fire and in his underwear. But if he really wanted to get away, you know, like... You'd think he would have had fresh clothes hidden in the park or something, you know, so he could get away. But I wonder if he was just trying to frame Sharon for this whole thing by taking Adam to the children's hospital and throwing out those accusations, you know, Mm -hmm. if that was part of his plan. And I also wonder if Adam actually did have signs of abuse during this doctor visit, but he blamed it on Sharon and the doctor's let her leave with him because he had the custody paperwork, you know? Who knows? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not on record. I also wonder if he actually planned to kill himself, too, but chickened out. I mean, that's what um, Sharon's family member got from the phone call, is that he was going to kill himself, but then he was running away like a baby, you know? Yeah, maybe that was part of the original plan. Yeah, and that says even more about his character that maybe he was in the car with her and he decided, oh, I don't want to do this, or this hurts. Yeah, just a disgusting human being. But, I mean, the only motive I can really think of here is revenge over the breakup. Mm-hmm. Like, why else would he do this? There's absolutely nothing that could make this make sense. Mm. Do you have any other thoughts, Rosie, before we wrap it up? No, I mean, we'll never really know what he was thinking. But it is infuriating, and it does make you feel better that he suffered for seven months before he died. Yeah, as terrible as that feels to say, it's, I mean, yeah, it's true. It makes sense. But anyway, well, thank you guys for Mm. following us on this crazy story. We've had a couple of doozies. Yeah, next week will be a much lighter topic. It's not about a child. It's actually about something that's very, I guess you could say it's a hot topic right now. But um, <laughs> I don't want to spoil it. So I'll just leave it at that. And yeah. So do we have any cat news, Rosie? Well, you bought zucchini a shirt. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we should probably put that up. Yeah, we will post that on Instagram and at some point. Why did you buy him a shirt again? Because I had a stuffed animal that was wearing a shirt, and Ryan had a drink, and he took the stuffed animal, and he looked at it and started weeping <laughs> because he thought it was so cute. So he went on Amazon and he found a, Weeping? a shirt. Is that the right word? <laughs> yes, it is. And Zucchini wasn't thrilled. Speaking of weeping, <laughs> watch Onward if you have Disney Plus. That one will get you if yeah. you have any daddy issues. <laughs> another another circumstance where Ryan was weeping <laughs> after <sighs> watching that movie. I know. I I have. I hope there's nothing wrong with me. I never used to cry this easily. No, you've pretty much always been this emotional. Okay. He's a, a moody boy. It's moody? <laughs> um, we don't really have any news. We're moving in a couple of weeks physically, our home. So we've been not, we've been slacking, to be honest, but next week is the week. Well, we've been working, so, um, but yeah, we've been a little stressed out. 
hopefully that hasn't come through too much. Had a pregnancy scare. Oh, you do want to talk about that, huh? I don't care. It's fine because we're not pregnant, but we had a scare. Yeah, pretty much since, what, Sunday? Friday? No, Friday, you were like, I think I might be pregnant. <laughs> and then she missed her regular time, and... But it was fine. It was only a day late, so we're good to go. It was just a little... I was just nervous and stressed, you know, all this craziness that's going on. Yeah. But Rye Guy, he came back with from Walmart with a bag of, like, five pregnancy tests, a chocolate, a cookie cake. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that made me feel better. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully it was, I mean, now we know it was just stress. And we're guessing it's because of the move and the pandemic that's happening right now and just all the big changes that we've been making. Yeah. You know, it's a lot for someone to experience in in one week so like but, yeah there's a little sliver of our life of that, that's real man yeah, that, that was, was real real <laughs> all right well we should probably wrap it up before we spoil the tone mm-hmm. too much but um thank you guys so much for listening you can obviously follow us anywhere we are uh, instagram twitter youtube Patreon. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review. It's for a good cause. Yeah, on podchaser.com. That's the place to do it. And it has to be, I believe, by April 15th or 16th. But just do it as soon as possible, and it'll be good. They'll be donating 25 cents per review and 25 cents per response. So we will respond to you. Anyway, thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week. Bye.